Hello, and welcome to POMA Does, a podcast produced by the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association. We provide a voice for osteopathic medicine and share insights on issues important to osteopathic physicians, residents, and students, as well as those who embrace the osteopathic philosophy. POMA's mission is to promote the distinctive philosophy and practice of osteopathic medicine in Pennsylvania for our members and their patients. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of POMA Does podcast series, sponsored by the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association. I'm Nick Diebeck with my co-host, Barton Matosion. We're both medical students at the LeadCom campus. I was from Erie, and he was from Seton Hill. And we're here with our special guest today, Dr. Gimple, who is the president of NBOME and a family medical physician at osteopathic medicine. So the purpose of this episode, a lot of people have been wondering, especially second, third year, and especially first now, medical students want to know with residency and how these boards are becoming pass fail, what do we do to be able to excel in our application to get into the residency we want to get into? So we have Dr. Gimple here to lay out all the facts for all of us and hopefully put all of us at ease. To be able to start off with boards and talking about level one versus USMLE step one, Dr. Gimple, give us an insight. What's the difference between level one complex and step one USMLE? Great question, Nick. And hello, everybody. It's really an honor to be here with the students and with all of you joining us today. Great question. And I think it is essential to kind of understanding the part of self-regulation for a profession that is called licensure exams. Why do I have to take licensure exams, right? Well, licensure exams are designed to help protect the public to make sure that every doctor, in this case, an osteopathic physician, has demonstrated her or his competencies for entry into that profession. A profession needs to self-regulate, which means a profession itself has to set the standards for who gets to enter it and how the public is protected. And the public trusts that any profession, and in this case, osteopathic medicine, has its own standards and its own assessments for that entry. So Comlex USA is designed specifically to assess the competencies required for the practice of osteopathic medicine. And it's also designed specifically to be aligned with the educational program leading to the DO degree at LECOM, at PCOM, at any of the other nation's colleges of osteopathic medicine. And as you know, studying there at LECOM or at PCOM or at any of the campuses around the country, there are many unique and distinctive aspects to our osteopathic medical education pathway. That's why AT still, you know, over 120 or so years ago, founded this profession to say, we have a different pathway. We have a distinctive approach. We emphasize certain things. We de-emphasize certain others. And our approach to patients, that interconnected body, mind, spirit approach is distinctive. And therefore, the assessments, for example, in level one of Comlex have that development baked in or built into the assessment program. Now, for those listening in and understanding that the distinctive nature that we have in our studies in education with OMM, when they look for a physician for MD and DO, would you agree that the information that you learn aside from OMM for the licensure exams, the information is the exact same? There's really nothing different that we study from MDs, except we just have that added portion of OMM. Well, yes and no, Nick. What I would say is science is science, and osteopathic physicians embrace and study and learn biomedical sciences like anatomy and like pharmacology and like physiology, the same way that any good physician or, in fact, other health professionals study and embrace. But the approach is different. The emphasis is different. The amount, for example, anatomy, since osteopathic physicians really value that structure function tenant, right? Structure and function being reciprocally interrelated and and critical to each other. Well, the approach and the integration of that learning of the anatomy is different in most osteopathic medical schools as it is, let's say, in a school granting an MD degree, just to give you that answer. And I think sometimes early on in our training and others even later on in their training. And, you know, I'm a PGY 33 or so right now. I've been at this for training and learning for a long time, and I still have a lot to learn. But I think some people along the path jump to the conclusion that a DO is the same as an MD, but they have an extra tool in the toolbox. It's an MD plus something else. And I think the danger, that's just too simplistic. It's a nice elevator speech, but it's really too simplistic. And I think it yields to expediency at the detriment of really understanding that approaching a patient osteopathically is more than just, oh, well, if they have a structural issue, I give OMT. 
It is body, mind, and spirit. It is mm -hmm. integrating social determinants of health. It is integrating their psychological, their spiritual, their everything about that person and integrating the shared negotiation of both a diagnostic and a treatment plan with the patient from the start, which is all essential to the osteopathic approach to health. I like how you describe an MD plus a little bit is too simplistic because they don't understand the amount of time and commitment and different perspectives of life itself that we have to look at to be able to help take care of our patients. Vartan, what's a question that you have? Yeah, so just along those lines, and thank you for being on this, Dr. Yimbo. We appreciate your time and your input on this. To be able to fully appreciate that there's a, a different philosophy and a different line of thinking, we have these two exams. And myself, and I'm sure many other medical students are probably wondering, if I choose not to take step one as well as level one, because as you know, it's not required for the Yale students, only MD students, but many people might feel to be on a level playing field. Do I need to take this exam? Will it hurt me if I don't take this exam? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and it's understandable. I think I can remember my first days, I went to PCOM in Philadelphia and my first days having imposter syndrome from like literally orientation in medical school, because I'm looking around and saying, oh my gosh, she's really smart. He was a nurse. She has a PhD. Am I going to be good enough to be mm -hmm. somebody's doctor? And I think Honestly, that's a really good sign. If you undergo some element of imposter syndrome as early on as an osteopathic medical student, it's a good sign because it's going to show that you're always going to have the humility to know there's always going to be things you don't know. There's always going to be things you need to continue to learn. And it gives you that humility that I think helps you really engage with patients in a special way. I think, unfortunately, this issue of do I also need to take a second licensing exam in order to be competitive in some cases because it might be a reality. If I'm applying in a super subspecialty type of a field and I really want to go to a program, I'll make it up in Boston, and I really want to be the most competitive, well, I'll joke, maybe I should take USMLE step one. Maybe I should take podiatry exam, the nursing exam, and any other exam that they'll let me, any other badge that I can have to outcompete Vartan and Nick, I want to have because I want to show that mm -hmm. I'm the best candidate. Now, I say that not glib, it's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but I know that there are some realities which make students certainly feel compelled to do that. But I think the vast majority of programs, especially in the fields where, frankly, the vast majority of DOs tend to migrate towards, like family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, et cetera, are extremely embracing both of DOs and of DOs who really do embrace that distinctive approach and DOs who have COMLEX as their licensing exam but don't have a step of USMLE. And I think since the single GME accreditation system, we've continued to see increasing match rates. We've seen more DOs matching into fellowship programs across the board in various different internal medicine, pediatrics, and other specialties, for example. And while there've been some bumps in the road and some particular disciplines where it's a little bit trickier, for the most part, I think more and more program directors understand that you, Varner, a DO student, you take Comlex. And I can kind of put you on a level playing field. I can scale that up. I can use the tools that are available mm -hmm. and I can kind of learn how to evaluate whether or not you would be happy in my program, successful in my program, whether you would add good things to the program. And I think most DOs are finding themselves to have a pretty good increasing acceptance rate in residency programs throughout. But there still are some challenges certainly in the system. And I think advocacy initiatives like the AOA, the AACOM, ACOM, the NBOME has been at it for a long, long time. Some of the student organizations have been really uh, active in helping us to continue to advocate for DOs and their unique qualifications continue to be really important because there are still a subset of residency program directors that don't understand DO applicants. They don't mm -hmm. accept them. They don't typically give them interviews. No matter what test you take, no matter what scores you get on either exam, it has more to do with they don't understand our pathway because it's not the pathway they chose. They don't mm -hmm. understand the rigor in our clinical rotations. You know, especially we heard a program director recently say, well, I'm not sure from rural schools, whether that be a DO or MD student, that they really have rigorous experiences with complex patients. And it's like, obviously that's said from somebody who's never been in a community-based or rural type hospital. Yeah, where they haven't been there to experience it firsthand to understand what backup. other you people are going through. Exactly, Nick. You don't have yeah. to back up. You have three fellows and four residents and five interns to be behind. When you're a student rotating there, you're often first assist with that attempt. Uh, I, would I would definitely say I have colleagues right now that are in those rural areas who are getting much more experience than I am right now because I'm in Pittsburgh right now in the AHN system. 
I get a great experience there. I love the faculty. I love everything there. But there could be times where there's a resident plus a fellow, and you don't get to be as much hands-on. You're delivering the babies in those rotations. Yeah, exactly. As opposed to lined up five behind the intern who's trying to get his right. delivery quota. But that all boils down to one thing. It's called bias, and it's hidden yes. biases of good people. Program directors mm -hmm. are good people. They want to have yeah. good residents who are kind to each other, kind to the patients, competent, and are going to succeed and do well in the program. And I think if you can convince, kind of similar to your entree there, Nick, about how to be successful in applying to residents, convince the program directors that you have had a rigorous training experience throughout in mm -hmm. case maybe they haven't really had other DOs in the program or haven't had experience with DO residents or what have you. That's much more important than stacking up additional licensure exams or other badges that you need along those levels. And certainly we can talk more about applying to residencies later, but overall, the single GME accreditation system has been good for the profession in terms of providing more opportunities for osteopathic students. Of course, we have a lot more of them than we had 10 years ago. So providing the opportunities for everyone to find a training spot that is going to make them happy, is going to help them to live their dream of being somebody's doctor, somebody's osteopathic physician mm -hmm. after just a few more years of training. So uh, all in all, opportunities is what that was all about. Right. Staying in line with licensure, news came out this past year that level two PE is no more right now. So can you give me more of an insight about that? Is it coming back? What's going on with the NBME side of that? Has there been communication about that? between the two parties? Oh, great questions. Yeah, we did ultimately permanently suspend or take that examination offline. So level two PE is not available and it's not coming back as level two PE for your generation for the next couple of years for the foreseeable future. It does, however, in the eyes of the licensure community and others, leave a bit of a void in terms of assessing some of the competencies that are fundamental to the osteopathic medical profession and to delivering good quality care, whether you're a you know, a DO or any other type of practitioner, nurse, et cetera. Things like communication skills, communicating effectively with patients, which is so critical to reducing errors, increasing satisfaction, making good diagnoses, delivering empathy, cultural humility, all that comes in the, in the, in the form of communication. So how are we going to test that? Well, we already do test it to some degree in the multiple choice exams, but that's more the knowledge of or dancing around certain aspects that are important to it, which are relevant, but it doesn't test your ability to actually demonstrate that you can really communicate. Now, the schools said during that time, well, we do this at the schools, so it's not really necessary to be part of the licensure exam. But the licensing boards would push back and say, but you also teach anatomy and test anatomy at the schools, and we want that to be part of the licensure exam too. So the licensure community, self-regulation community, really wants an arm's length type assessment that everybody meets this national standard. So how are we going to explore that moving forward? Well, rather than make a decision in a rash fashion during the COVID pandemic, we put together a special commission that had actually two and then ultimately three osteopathic medical students and residents. It had representatives from the licensure community, from the teaching community in hospitals, as well as in osteopathic medical schools, basically representatives from the organizations within osteopathic medicine, like AOA and AACOM. These folks studied the issue, brought in patient and patient advocates. They brought in more students. They brought in experts on patient safety. They brought in testing experts, including organizations like NBME and the Medical Council of Canada, who does what we do kind of for physicians up in Canada and brought in consultations from all these groups and really studied the issue. The bottom line is they came to a conclusion and it's published on our website if you'd like to read more, that basically said assessing these fundamental competencies are critical for the osteopathic profession, but they could be done in a different way. And while having them done at two national centers in Philadelphia and Chicago served a really good purpose over the last 20 years almost, perhaps they could be done on the college campuses so that students are reduced in hardship from the burden of having to travel to these national centers, expense that that costs, for example, some of the extra stress that that adds, especially when travel doesn't go well. Those are great points because as a medical student, knowing about expenses, if you're not a physician, you went through all this, these exams are expensive. You get up to about $500 per exam. Plus you need to get a hotel room and all the added stress. So 
on behalf of all the medical students, we thank you guys for being able to well, do We certainly that want to us. reduce the burden, but we also don't want to add a burden on the other end where you have licensure issues or you have exactly. practice issues. Yeah. You don't do well with patients because you haven't demonstrated these skills, right? So we want to make sure you have that badge and that credential. So essentially what we're doing, and again, you can read much more on the website, Nick and Vartan, but we've named this project for the time being the Core Competency Capstone Initiative where we're studying the ability to provide some type of a prototype clinical skills assessment to a national standard, but at the schools. Not the same as what we tested in the level two PE, but certainly would probably assess doctor-patient communication. Certainly would probably assess hands-on physical exam and probably OMT, OMM, but done to some type of a national standard, but at the schools, probably late in the third year, early in the fourth year of osteopathic medical school. And also, while it could become part of the licensure pathway, it wouldn't have a negative consequence. In other words, if you fail the exam the first time, like a competency-based assessment, you get to remediate and come back and retake the exam, not get a fail on a transcript that would hurt you in applying to residencies, for example, potentially. Those are some of the concepts. None of this is ironed out. It has to be worked through a period. It's going to take several years. But in the meantime, what we do have in the complex pathway is every student gets an attestation from their dean at their college of osteopathic medicine that she or he have demonstrated these fundamental competencies as signed off by the faculty there at your school. And that essentially puts the check in that box for the student to move on, progress through to graduation, and also be able to take their level three of Comlex when they're an intern or, or second year resident. Which is a good product to have because when you have the colleges look at the students and see if they're competent enough, that starts in even year one and year two. I remember being in the Erie campus, we start trying to do, you know, patient simulation and trying to act out being patients and being the physicians in the matter. And then that translates going into our rotations year for years three and four. So it's almost getting a little bit of a head start in that concept. So you're able to ingrain that and plant the seed even earlier. Exactly. So it's going to be very interesting. I think it's very innovative, but it's also, you know, I'm really proud of the way our profession stood up because it really wasn't an NBOME decision. This was a decision that our profession made together, including the student organizations and the licensure community and patients, public members who said, you know what, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because let's face it, what is on the test does drive teaching, does drive learning, and it does drive behavior, and it drives resources. And for the deans to get the resources from boards of directors and such to be able to put towards teaching of things, doctor-patient communication and assessment of things like OMT is helped and, in fact, catalyzed by the fact that it's going to be part of the national licensure assessment. So we feel really good about the future. We've got a lot of work to do, but I think working together across the profession, we can make sure that our DOs continue to be trusted at all of the tables that they're currently trusted at, hired at all of the hospitals and all the group practices, you know, in some of the most important positions in healthcare across the United States and keep that trust going. That sounds great. Thank you for that. Thank you for explaining that a little more clearly for everyone who was listening. So we have a better understanding, but that has me thinking, and if I could shift the discussion, maybe just slightly with the uh, historic tests being out of the way, such as the PE and the scored version of the level one, I guess a lot of students are probably wondering, well, if we don't have these two metrics, now we have one single scored metric, how can we stand out for residencies? How can we show that we're, you know, excelling in certain ways and making sure that we're being as competitive or just the best students that we can be, maybe not necessarily competitive, but just showing off and our skills. Add, right? add a little bit to that, and comic. You also give a comment on osteopathic students going step one pass fail and taking step two, which has another numerical score to try to be on more of a level playing field, especially for specialties that are a little bit more competitive. Right. Very good questions. And, you know, I got to participate during the worst of the pandemic on about a 15-month project called, bear with me, it's a long name, the Coalition for Physician Accountability's UME to GME Transition Review Committee. This was- There has to be an acronym for that. The you UGRC, guys have to make an acronym. <laughs> the UGRC spent 15 or 16 months with 30 of us, mostly MDs, but a couple DOs, three or four of us from the DO community were on there. And looking at how do we ease this transition and not have so much stress, so much cost, so much anxiety, so much FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. How do we kind of level that playing field and try to have doctors who are feeling less anxious about things, but more excited about learning and excited about being a really good doctor and being caring at the point of need when patients come to doctors, right? I mean, that's ultimately what we all want. 
And so I think the move to pass fail, that was one of the big rationales for level one to move to pass fail. And I think step one had a similar rationale. Let's try to take out some of that anxiety. By the same token, I will point out, and I've tried to emphasize to student audiences, don't stop bringing it in terms of your preparation for level one, because if you fail, you know, it's not what this was designed for, but unfortunately, the fact of the matter is for some of the real competitive residency programs, you could get screened out of interviewing with a failure. We, NBOME, advocates for holistic review of applications. And I would hope that any student who has a one failure on something or whatever should not be held back for that one thing, but yet put her or him in the full context of the full person. If you have, if you go to a school that has grades, what's your grade point average? What is your class rank? What are some of the other unique attributes that you bring to the table, like your experiences, your community involvement, your volunteerism, your experiences from undergrad all through, you know, LECOM or PCOM or whatever school you go to. So that's really consistent with holistic review. Hopefully the pass fail on the level one, you still bring it and you still engage. And of course, people always ask the question, I thought you might ask, how do you prepare for level one? Well, the best data shows the best preparation for level one is full 110% engagement in the curricular program leading to your DO degree. So every class, every lecture, every PBL, TBL, whatever you're doing, every small group, every OMM lab, the co-curricular things that go on in the evenings when you have a visiting professor in. And then, of course, other things that might help you like practice test questions and question banks or ComSay or Wellcom or these things. But there's so many other resources on how to prepare for these exams. I won't add anything more there, but I would say in general, focus on what are those other things that can help you to be who you are. If you're somebody who really has that volunteer community, you know, spirit, Go and do that and be proud of that and make sure that comes forward in your personal statement and in your press application. If you're a research-oriented individual and you're applying to specialties where research is an essential element, well then research, whether it's published or other abstracts or whatever, will probably be important to that specialty. But that's a real specialty by specialty and program by program specific that doing your research will help you to figure out. And I would tell you that your faculty at your schools LECOM, I know them very well. PCOM, I know them very well. All the campuses of both of those and any other students around the country, they're real professionals. They are in the best position to advise you on, do you need to add this other thing to your application? Like Nick, you mentioned, maybe for certain situations, a real competitive specialty, I'll mention neurosurgery or dermatology. Okay, maybe you might want to consider taking a step two on top of your level one so that all of the programs would accept your, or at least most would accept your application at least to review it. But then in those particular specialties, there are probably other unique things that you want to do to add to your application to make sure that they really know you're all about dermatology or you're all about neurosciences or all about their particular program to there. But I would tell you for internal medicine, for psychiatry, for family medicine, for pediatrics and whatever, physical medicine and rehab, good example, 100% of residency program directors report accepting and interviewing DO. And 100% of residency program directors in PM&R use Comlex for DO applicants and do not require USMLE. Just to give you a really good example. So Family Medicine just recently put out all of the academic groups in Family Medicine. I don't know if you saw it, um, a wonderful statement that said, to ask a DO student to take a USMLE is a discriminatory behavior. Don't accept that. DOs take complex, MDs take USMLE, and both should be used equivalently, you know, as part of a holistic review for applicants in family medicine. And of course, 95 plus percent of residency programs in family medicine accept DOs, welcome DOs, and accept complex and use complex in the application process. But your faculty at your schools are probably very well equipped to give you that individual guidance as to, are you somebody that should do some of these other things? How's your application looking? What would you like to beef up? What should you focus on in your personal statement and others? And as everybody always tells you, be yourself because you want them to want you for who you are. So when you go there, you'll be happy in your own skin and you'll be accepted for the contribution you're going to make to that residency program because you might be there three years, you might be there five years. And I think that's really important. That was a great explanation. Honestly, there's so much you just went into that just motivated me. Made me want to run through a wall right now, actually. You got me really pumped up. You got to start giving me like pregame speeches before exams and whatnot. I love that. Use a lot of caffeine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, caffeine is every physician and student doctor's best friend. And we all love it. You did make a good point, though, that the discriminatory factor, how we could feel like that sometimes. And we know as DOs, as we're evolving more and more and more 
the level field is becoming more and more even, but some residency programs and directors, you know, may still be a little bit naive and not have that level playing field. But as we're approaching that level field from where we were 30 years ago, do you ever foresee a common licensure examination for MDs and DOs and then having a separate OMM part for DO licensure, or is going to keep it how it is now? Yeah. Well, as I started off with the kind of why we have the two paths, right? I think as long as osteopathic medicine recognizes as a profession that we are a distinctive profession yeah. operating kind of in parallel with our friends, you know, who are MDs who are a distinctive profession. And as long as we believe that the osteopathic philosophy, in fact, integrates with our full approach, that body, mind, spirit approach, we need to have an assessment that is distinctive along that level to, again, both protect the patients and also to make sure that the teaching, the learning, the resources derive towards that distinctive element. Having a separate tack on subject exam is like that description I gave earlier that I think is expedient. It's a great elevator speech, but it really does confuse the issue. And that's that extra tool in the toolbox. DOs are not just somebody who has an extra tool and you can test that extra tool. Complex actually has osteopathic tenets and principles integrated throughout all the elements, even the way we present the cases the blueprint with the competencies in complex really group and sample from the content. We even, for example, study what osteopathic physicians see and do in practice. We look at national ambulatory and hospital statistics, and we, no surprise, find that DOs see more common presentations related to the musculoskeletal system. So our assessment is going to have more content related to that system, just like our curricular program has more content related to patients presenting with those types of complaints. Which makes yeah. sense why the PM&R community loves the DO <laughs> so much is because we study it even harder, might as well keep us in that realm, especially makes, for that. Makes a lot of sense. So I don't think there's movement. There has been encouragement. You may know that there was a group of students, one of the larger student organizations who came together so and said, we, we think this is the way because we, we think the discrimination, that this is disadvantaging us. Of course, still about 40% of DO students around the nation don't take a USMLE step. They just take Comlex and they do very, very well and match very, very well as well. But they thought that that was a convenient kind of way of moving there. But of course, there are a number of licensing boards across the country that do not license MDs. They only license DOs in their states. Mm -hmm. And they require osteopathic licensing exams because they want to demonstrate to the public that the DO has actually demonstrated their competency for the practice of osteopathic medicine, an MD plus an extra tool in her toolbox, but actually an integrated approach. In the intermediate future, I don't see that approach moving forward. We have discussed it certainly with, with the student organizations and have, I think, described why AOA has an official position that the only exam for licensure for DOs are those that are osteopathically distinctive, like those put out by the NBOME. We continue to have discussions and to hear feedback and certainly to advocate for DO students and their qualifications. And we would implore any student who feels that they run into a situation where they feel discriminated against to let us know where did you feel, where did they tell you you couldn't be interviewed or where did they say you couldn't do a visiting rotation? Or where did they say you needed to take a USMLE if you're a DO student and you have Comlex? If you go to our website, we have a new section I'm so excited about, Nick, that is on our website that's called an advocacy page, where we actually have kind of some tallies of just the most recent advocacy wins, like in Brigham and Women's up in Boston and at Oregon Health Sciences University and others, where a few months ago they said USMLE was required. But in that, it was mostly because they didn't realize that DO students take Comlex or that in some specialties, now it says Comlex accepted for DO students. And if you go to that portion on our website, as new updates in these advocacy wins come about, we keep that updated. And you can be part of that solution as a DO student. If you encounter a program that seems to be in need of some education, reach out to us. We can reach out in a nice way and provide that to them. I tell you what, on behalf of even Barton and I and all the medical students, we appreciate all the strides you've been making to help DOs be more and more recognized. And even growing up as a kid and having physicians in my family, you always hear about the different levels of playing field. But ever since going through this process and growing into a future physician that I'm going to be one day, it's just great to be able to see that everyone's starting to recognize DOs as equals to MDs. And everyone just has to understand there's no butting heads between DOs and MDs. Our one goal is just to take care of patients. And that's our ultimate goal. 
So with that, we're going to be wrapping up. Barton, do you have any last ending questions for Dr. Gamble? I, I just wanted to emphasize how much we appreciate your time. We thank you for shining some light on these topics that a lot of us maybe may have questions about and don't fully understand. It, it means a lot to have it explained in a way that's really, really important and distinct, I should say, to really explain it in a way that makes sense to everyone and why there really aren't these differences and the differences are only things that emphasize our philosophy and our character. So like Nick said, I thank you for your work and advocating for all of us students and for not making us fly out to a Philly in Chicago. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Save us a lot of money on that one. But again, Dr. Gimple, it was an honor to be able to interview the president of NBME and a family physician. It was honestly a great talk. I've learned so much and I know many people will. For all those listeners out there, if you have any feedback on episode ideas, please email Poma, Poma, Poma at Poma.org and be sure to subscribe to the Poma Does podcast series on your favorite podcast platform or Poma's YouTube channel. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Dr. Gemple. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Good night. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Palma Does. Be sure to subscribe to Palma Does wherever you listen to your podcasts and tell your friends and colleagues to tune in. Learn more about osteopathic medicine and Palma on our webpage, www.palma.org, and join the conversation on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube, or email us at palma at palma.org. We'd love to hear from you. Join us next time for another edition of Palma Dust.